In the Japanese Zen tradition, the culmination of years of seated zazen meditation practice is said to sometimes produce a temporary state of extreme bliss known as kensho, which is precisely reminiscent of yoga's kundalini experience, as well as ecstatic states achieved on various entheogens or psychedelics. Similar to the latent coiled energy of Kundalini, Zen teaches that ordinary man is unenlightened, burdened by ego, and must overcome this human condition through silent stillness. Regularly and intentionally ceasing the stream of incessant thought via meditation allows the brain waking access to the rare cortical theta and delta states usually only achieved during sleep. By quieting the monkey mind of unrelenting thoughts and altering consciousness through deep breathing techniques, a kensho, or kundalini experience, can be triggered even without the yogic bodywork described previously. This ecstatic, euphoric experience, while incredible and worth striving for, should not be seen as the end goal of yogic or Zen training, but rather like a well-deserved reward along the path, letting the practitioner know they are heading in the right direction. Zen master Katsuki Sakita asks in his book Zen Training Methods and Philosophy, if Kensho was the ultimate aim of Zen training, why not simply take drugs to achieve the same condition? He insists that repeated experience of the state of absolute samadhi is the true essential requirement and ultimate aim of such mindfulness practice, not Kensho. Sakita writes that, Kensho has been presented as the ultimate aim, but Zen training continues endlessly. To cast off the delusive way of ordinary consciousness while sitting on a cushion in a quiet room is only the beginning. For many, perhaps, there has been something unattractive in the notion, not infrequently conveyed, of the Zen student as a person who subjects himself to a prolonged, highly disciplined form of training, usually in the artificial conditions of a monastery, in order to undergo some kind of private, revelatory experience. The student must learn to live in the ordinary world, while yet retaining the quality of his experience of absolute samadhi. So the Kensho or Kundalini experience should not be viewed as the end goal or final product of meditation and yoga, but more like a signpost that the practitioner has reached a certain level, similar to martial arts students receiving their black belt. A black belt does not mean martial training is complete or that the practitioner has reached their peak. Far from it, the receiving of one's black belt simply means they have completed all the basics and are now ready to spend a lifetime perfecting them. On the spiritual path, our main focuses should be the blossoming of compassion, the dissolution of the ego, the refinement of character, and other loftier pursuits than a mere Kensho or Kundalini experience. In Christian esotericism, there are the concepts of seven levels of heaven, seven levels of hell, seven deadly sins, and seven heavenly virtues, which directly correspond with the seven yoga chakras. For Kundalini to rise, the yogi cleanses and opens his chakras through a process of not only physiological, but also psychological self-development, composed of seven steps, each belonging to a physical location in the body. For example, the first root chakra, related to security and survival, when closed, corresponds to the deadly sin of greed, but when opened, corresponds to the heavenly virtue of generosity. The second sacral chakra, related to sexuality and relationships, when closed, corresponds to the deadly sin of lust, but when opened, corresponds to the heavenly virtue of chastity. Thus, a selfless person who sincerely and diligently develops all seven virtues helps open themselves up to kundalini awakening and is allowed access to the seven heavens, whereas a selfish person who completely and unremorsefully indulges in all seven vices, conversely closes themselves off from kundalini and finds themselves in hell. The concept of seven heavens and seven hells is nearly ubiquitous in the world's religions. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism all reference this idea and color it with connotations of the afterlife. In the microcosm, we create our own personal heavens and hells based on our developments of virtues or indulgence in vices. In the macrocosm, these life choices and character traits are then corresponded with afterlife worlds, 
seven ascending levels of heaven, or seven descending levels of hell, depending on each individual's karma. For example, in the ancient Mesopotamian religion, Earth was presented as a flat disk covered by seven domes, each one containing different celestial bodies. These corresponded to the macroscopic seven heavens, whereas the seven chakras within the individual corresponded to the microscopic seven heavens. These also mesh and correspond quite well with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which place upon a series of steps the various physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual necessities for a fully developed, fully realized human being. Just like the yoga chakra system and the esoteric Christian system, Maslow's hierarchy begins with base physiological needs, like food and water at the bottom, then safety needs, like being secure from danger. Near the heart chakra, we find belonging needs, like being loved and accepted, along with esteem needs, like being recognized and respected. As we reach the higher chakras, we find cognitive needs, like knowledge and exploration, as well as aesthetic needs, like order and beauty. Then, once all the lower physical, emotional, and psychological needs have been met, finally, the crown chakra of self-actualization, the spiritual work of finding self-fulfillment and realizing one's true potential, can begin. Just as the rising kundalini relates to the seven virtues and seven heavens, Gnostic mystics like Samuel Ann War and George Gurdjieff wrote of the kunda buffer and its relation to the seven vices and seven hells. War posited that just as virtuous practice causes the ascending serpent of kundalini to travel upwards from the apex of the sacrum, the negative indulgences and vices contrarily causes the descending kunda buffer serpent to travel downwards into the Cossacks, the tail of Satan. In his book, The Elimination of Satan's Tail, and many others, he details the parallels between Christianity and yoga, and describes the karmic self-development necessary to become a fully realized and enlightened human being. John Phillips wrote, The enterprising mariner who ventured first from the shelter of the shore to steer their flimsy vessels out of sight of land were haunted by many superstitious fears. One of those was the legendary Lodestone Mountain that had the power, they thought, to seize a vessel against all the tug of wind and tide and draw it to destruction on its shores. Sin is a Lodestone Mountain. We feel ourselves drawn by that mountain, against all the counter-pull of effort and resolve, until we are shipwrecked on its shores. The Christian Seven Deadly Sins and Seven Heavenly Virtues are just one spiritual system, one set of karmic suggestions, but certainly one well worth considering. There are different ideas about which sins and virtues directly apply to which chakras, but the exact ordering is far less important than the overall moral message. The first deadly sin, related to the root chakra of security and survival, is greed or avarice, which is the inordinate or insatiable desire for material gain such as money, status, and power, beyond what is necessary or deserved. Greedy people may increase their material gains through such a vice, but they will never make any spiritual gains, or succeed in developing the first heavenly virtue, generosity, which naturally appears once one renounces and repents the sin of greed. Generosity, also known as charity or largesse, is the virtue of being unattached to material possessions and sharing selflessly. The second deadly sin, related to the sacral chakra of sexuality and relationships, is lust, the intense sexual desire for people or situations purely for personal pleasure. The wanton ejaculation of our most sacred life-giving substance is ill-advised and a subject too deep to delve into here, but suffice to say, Anyone serious about improving both their physiological and psychological well-being should try to abstain from masturbation and promiscuity. By doing so, and effectively renouncing and repenting from the sin of lust, the heavenly virtue of chastity naturally arises. Chastity is sexual purity, achieved either through celibacy, through tantra, and or a loving partner. The third deadly sin related to the solar plexus chakra of willpower, self-discipline, and self-esteem, is sloth. Also known as acedia or apathy, sloth is the habitual, 
disinclination to exertion, or quite simply, laziness. It is characterized by the neglect of one's responsibilities and related to melancholy and depression. By renouncing and repenting the deadly sin of sloth, however, the heavenly virtue of diligence is able to manifest. Diligence is defined as carefulness and persistent effort in one's duties, a good work ethic. The fourth deadly sin, related to the heart chakra of love, compassion, and acceptance, is wrath, uncontrolled feelings of anger, rage, or hatred. Wrath usually reveals itself in the wish to seek revenge. The vengeful, spiteful person, under the grips of wrath, tends to be not only aggressive and violent to others, but self-destructive through things like drug and alcohol abuse or suicide. One who renounces and repents the deadly sin of wrath manifests the heavenly virtue of patience or forbearance. Patience is the level of endurance one can have before succumbing to negativity, tolerance in the face of provocation without responding in anger or annoyance, and the ability to endure difficult circumstances without hastiness or impetuousness. The fifth deadly sin, related to the throat chakra of growth and expression, is gluttony, the overindulgence or overconsumption of food, drink, and other consumables. The so-called fat acceptance movement might as well be called the gluttonous entitlement or addiction acceptance movement. Once a glutton renounces and repents their sin, however, they can begin to develop the virtue of temperance. Temperance is moderation, balance, and voluntary self-restraint. Restraint from retaliation through forgiveness, restraint from arrogance through modesty, restraint from excesses through prudence, and restraint from cravings and addictions through calmness and self-control. The sixth deadly sin, related to the third eye chakra of intuition and wisdom, is envy, which, similar to greed and lust, is characterized by insatiable desire. Envy is sadness or anger at seeing another's good fortune, resentful covetousness towards the possessions or traits of someone else. Once fully renounced and repented, however, the sin of envy transforms into the virtue of gratitude. Gratefulness or thankfulness is the feeling of appreciation felt and shown for one's life and to the givers of kindness, help, or gifts. The seventh deadly sin, related to the crown chakra of beingness and karma, is pride or hubris, having an irrationally high sense of one's personal value, status, or accomplishments, failing to acknowledge the accomplishments of others, and believing oneself fundamentally superior to others. Pride can also have a positive connotation, however, referring to an appropriate sense of esteem for one's own or another's choices and actions, which is certainly not a sin, making hubris a more accurate term. Once hubris is overcome, renounced, and repented, the heavenly virtue of humility can be developed. Humility is quite simply being humble. It is the opposite of narcissism, having low self-preoccupation and low self-regard, but without being self-deprecating. Unconsciously allowing ourselves to engage in sinful thoughts and behaviors disconnects us from our higher chakras, prevents us from developing real integrity, and restricts our ability to become truly virtuous human beings. Consciously ceasing sinful thoughts and behaviors, however, connects us to our higher chakras, aids us in developing integrity, and allows access to virtue and veritable enlightenment. Beyond this, all the world's religious systems have some conception and promise of karma or divine judgment, whereby individuals are guaranteed a heavenly or hellish afterlife based on our actions here. Why carelessly continue indulgence in vices and sinful actions at the expense of virtue, integrity, and potentially eternity? Literalist Christians read the Bible, and specifically the book of Revelations, as an ominous doomsday prophecy whereby humanity's highest virtue, and the only answer to evil, is waiting around until a half-god, half-man literally floats down from the clouds to save them and the world. They believe the devil will bring hell on earth for seven years of great tribulation with literal tortures worse than any horror movie, and that it is inevitable. But if they simply believe in Jesus, have a priest dunk their heads underwater, and or say a prayer accepting Christ into their hearts, that these acts are sufficient enough 
in the eyes of God for them to be timely teleported up to heaven with the other literalist Christians and spared the horrific tortures destined for all non-believers. If read with understanding of the spiritual symbology, numerology, and allegories purposely encoded, however, the true, deeper meaning of revelations is revealed. Once again, the author is imploring for humanity to awaken Kundalini and their seven chakras, to renounce vices and develop virtues, to disassociate with their lower carnal ego desires in order to access a higher level of spiritual consciousness. Revelations 120 states that the mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. The meaning of the seven churches and seven candlesticks certainly remains a mystery for those unaware of kundalini yoga and the chakra system. But for anyone acquainted with this ancient symbolism, the only mystery is why the masses continue to misinterpret these scriptures as literal doomsday prophecies. Revelations 4-5 reads, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is another clear description of the fiery electrical force of Kundalini rising through the seven chakras, for those with ears to hear and eyes to see. Revelations 5, 1 and 2 reads, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof? This is a call to action for any who wish to be truly free and saved from the addictions of the lower mind and egoistic desires. The angel with a loud voice is your higher self, calling you to look within and on the backside, and to loose the seven seals. For as long as Kundalini remains asleep and dormant, coiled around the root chakra, humanity is doomed to subsisting in a carnal, chaotic, materialistic condition. The chakras are referred to as seals, which require loosening, because in humanity's current condition we are not born with fully open and active chakras. Instead, we are born with original sin and seven seals, and only by awakening kundalini to clean out the emotional baggage and mental blockages from our collective unconscious can we rise above the fallen state. Only by renouncing and repenting from vices, addictions, and materialistic desires can the ego dissolve and break the seven seals. Revelations is imploring the reader to take responsibility for our spiritual growth and not to simply wait for Satan to bring hell in a handbasket. The great and terrible day of the Lord, promised in Revelations, that literalist Christians are so simultaneously dreading and welcoming, both scared and excited for, must be the most grossly misunderstood allegory in the Bible. The seven years of trials and tribulations are not some fatalistic prophecy of humanity's ultimate demise, but rather an epic allegory of the death throes of the ego and the lower carnal mind, upon opening the seven seals. Likewise, the great and terrible day of the Lord is nothing but the final dissolution of the ego and the death of one's lower self. According to ancient esoteric thought, each chakra contains spiritual life lessons, and as Kundalini rises, certain trials and tribulations are inevitable. But by inviting and transcending them, we successfully raise our consciousness to progressively more enlightened states. This is the true rapture and second coming, the real baptism of being born again, the awakening of Kundalini by purifying your temple to house Christ consciousness within. Genesis is about the generation of the higher self, a metaphorical manual for spiritual development, and Revelations is only a death sentence for the lower self, an epic obituary for the ego. All the world's religious scriptures are pointing towards and pleading with humanity to awaken this latent power within. From the oldest known mythologies like Atlantis, to the newest New Age philosophies like Theosophy, the repeated symbology, numerology, and allegories throughout disparate cultures and times tells a meta-narrative that only the well-researched or initiated will see. 
For the ignorant, indoctrinated masses, a combination of pseudoscience and religious literalism has most believing themselves to be either hairless apes spinning on a fantasy cartoon ball, or helpless victims of a vengeful, deterministic god who requires constant praise and submission. For those of us knowledgeable and acquainted with the reality of Flatlantis, however, the very concept of belief becomes antiquated and unnecessary, permanently replaced by common sense, evidence, experience, and endless exploration.